On the bottle, it says the Milton Distillery, but we know this distillery today is Strathyla. Tell us the story behind that. Absolutely, I think this is this will be a, an absolutely unique bottling. Um, the, the the company has used the name Strathyla for many years because that relationship we had with the distillery allowed us to use the Strathyla name, which was the name of the whisky which came from the distillery. But um, in 1949, it was actually called Milton Distillery. But Milton Distillery produced Strathyla whisky. So a little bit confusing. So we looked at it and said, well, actually, when we bottle this, this will be bottled as a, a Gordon McPhail bottling from the distillery. So it's going to be Gordon McPhail from Milton Distillery. It's a great privilege to share this moment with you guys mm. and celebrate this really unique whisky. Why did you decide to bottle it now, of all times? Because it's now the, the last of that batch of casks of 1949 that we filled, you're just looking at that point to say, when is, when, is the, when is the optimum? When has it reached its pinnacle? It's reached a point whereby um, the, the flavours, the, the characteristics are, are balanced, everything's just right. So now is the time to do it. The maturation of a whisky over such a long period of time, it's kind of this, this confluence of science and art coming together. Do you think it's one or the other? Well, I think it's fascinating that although we have all of this technology now and there's so many ways we can analyse, you know, whisky, and yet the human nose is still a really important yes. part of the yeah. selection process. And that's something really, that kind of wisdom and knowledge is something you can really only acquire mm. over years and, and generations mm. of yeah. experience, yeah. isn't it? Let's, let's dive in, let's have a nose and a taste. Can you pick up any smoke? It's a sort of fragrant smoke, it's almost mm. incense. Mm -hmm. There's an almost sort of nectarine, peachy mm. kind of character to it, isn't there, that gives it lots of charm uh, alongside its gravitas. Yeah, you know? I really want to see if that carries through onto the palate as well, because a uh, nose can really tell you a lot, but it's, it's about how it tastes, isn't it? Cheers. 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 Mm. Delicious. It reminds me so much of sort of like a, a blood orange and a, a Americano cocktail. So there's a, there's a little bit of that sort of bitter orange Amaro in there, a slight herbal character to it as well. But ultimately, for something so old, still actually pretty refreshing. <laughs> it's not a sort of not definitely not old and woody. This is not. It's definitely got weight, hasn't it? That lovely it waxiness comes yeah. through right in the mid palate with, teeth coating. with some mm. spice and that finish, it's lingering. But I think that, that mm. smokiness just comes at the end. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of drying element mm. to it. It's just a very subtle sort of drying sort of smokiness on the palate mm. just to finish off. Mm. It's also very, if you breathe in, it's slightly mentholic, you know, clovey, mm. cool, mm. cooling, you know, mm. when, you, when, you, when you breathe in. That's very interesting indeed. I think one very interesting aspect of, again, going back to this moment in time, is that in 1949, Milton Distillery would have been independently owned. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting concept because as an independently owned distillery, you make your own style of whiskey. Mm. So yes, um, yes. You, you make it for, for selling to blenders, mm -hmm. but you're not de your style is not determined by blenders. So uh, that ability to choose your own style, I think, as an independent, is, mm. is really important. And that would have fitted with our philosophy at the time, because we would have had that personal relationship with that independent mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. you know, with us as an independent sort of merchant here in Elgin, putting out our cast to be mm. filled at these distilleries. It was personal relationships with the people who actually yes. owned the distilleries. But that's what sets uh, Gordon McPhail apart from so many other whisky companies. You, you know, the, the, the business had that personal relationship with the distillery and importantly owned the wood that it was taking to be filled. So that, and there was that unbroken custodianship of the casks arriving because the company was importing sherry at that time. So would have been importing, would have had that, the other side of the relationship as well with the sherry house shipping the sherry the sherry would have been bottled, the cask would have been ready for filling, and then on to the distillery to be filled back to your warehouses. I mean, I can't think of uh, very many other examples out there in the world of whiskey of that kind of long-term, non-stop custodianship of a cask. It must have taken some foresight to retain those casks, to keep them back and look after certain casks as well. Surely at that point, it wasn't really the plan to age whiskey for 72 years. I think for us, we'd have known that some of those casts would have been kept for longer. Mm. Was there a plan to keep it for 72? <laughs> Probably not. But I think we're giving ourselves every opportunity to keep a cast for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the character keeps developing, the wood doesn't over influence, doesn't overtake the character. So you give yourself that opportunity to keep something for 72 years. Serendipity shouldn't be the thing. Oh, by luck, we've mm. ended uh, up mm. with Absol an old whiskey. Absolutely. It's such a rare joy 
to taste something which is not only older than me <laughs> but but really precedes my years and has its own moment defined in history yeah I, can't, I, I have no words to explain how, how wonderful it is to be able to enjoy something like this this is absolutely wonderful mm. cheers everyone cheers. Cheers. cheers thank you very much cheers.